I'm here. Yes. Are you here? All right. Hi. <laughs> Take it away. All right. Julie, you want to start us off? Yeah. Did you guys start doing anything yet? Or? No, no, no. We were just chit-chatting about stormtroopers and potty charts. <laughs> oh, love it. Love it. Love it. This is being recorded. <laughs> um, oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, for some reason, I couldn't do this on my computer, so I have to be on my phone for this. I apologize. OK. Oh, that's OK. Um, OK, so do we have a quorum? Yes. I'm okay, I can't see who's here because I'm on my. Uh, I have to be on my phone, unfortunately. So, yeah, okay. everyone's here except for Arena. And Perfect. Oh, there's Susan. Day. Hi, Susan. Um, okay, so does anyone have a motion to approve the minutes from the September meeting? Motion. I just heard David's voice. <laughs> <laughs> second. I'll second it. Okay, great. All right, so we will approve the minutes from the September meeting. Okay, Sarah. Um. Sure. So I just wanted to start, we'll definitely go through all of our programs and Carolyn has been so kind to join us and talk about some of the things that she's been focused on um, in the office. I just kind of wanted to get a pulse from everybody about how they feel the community is doing, what's happening at the high school, and any other things we should be focused on besides the obvious increased mental health needs in the community that we're trying desperately to make sure that we're covering all the residents who need it. Um, but how are you hearing things in the community? Josh, how's the high school? What, what are people's thoughts? All right. So for the most part in the high school, it's, it's doing well. Surprisingly off to a good start, I will say. There was one reported case of a teacher who got COVID uh, from, a, from a, a friend who, just because they, like, they were in close contact, then they got tested, found out they had COVID. So all the classes that they were exposed to uh, were put into quarantine for two weeks. I happened to be part of those two classes, which was a little brutal. I got robbed of my Columbus Day weekend. Kind of stunk. I already got tested. I'm negative. I'm all good. Uh, but there was a little bit of a commotion around that. There was a little bit of some wave shaking, but it wasn't too bad. It was kind of it was kind of like, whoa, this could, we should kind of like, it was just kind of like almost kind of the warning that a lot of students and definitely a lot of faculty needed about um, just kind of precautions, you know, cause it felt, it was, it was that feeling of, oh, this could be robbed up in like an instant without that full, this could be robbed up in like an instant. You know what I mean? Yeah. And now the expectation is that this will probably happen a lot throughout the year. Were people freaking out about it? Did you see a spike in like panic attacks or, it, increased anxieties or anything really severe where people just more annoyed that they had to quarantine? It was okay. So it's depending on the person for me, I'm, I'm very laid back. So I was kind of just like, Oh, I'm peeved. I had dinner plans with my friends this Friday. It's brutal. This stinks. But I did have some friends who are in, there's two cohorts, as you know, I'm in the gold cohort. And then there's also the blue cohort. I had some friends in the blue cohort were, who were kind of freaking out because they didn't get asked to quarantine, but they were like, oh, am I gonna get asked to quarantine? Just kind of like that anticipation factor was a little bit anxiety inducing. But from what I heard of the people who did get quarantined, they were kind of just like bummed. I mean, it was like, it stunk and like, oh, you're gonna be at home, but once you get tested, you can see your friends. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's not like, it's not like earth shattering world ending, it just kind of stinks. You know what I mean? It, mm -hmm. The only anxiety around it was, am I gonna get asked to quarantine? That was like the big thing. Mm -hmm. So not a ton of like crazy, like big panic attacks. Of course I have, I have one friend who's like anxiety prone and she was a little anxious about it. A little bit like, how am I gonna keep up with class? That was like the most I heard. And of course like, it's personal endeavors, but I feel like 
because the teacher went totally synchronous too, because they were the person they was the, that was the person who had it. You don't feel like you're getting lost behind the class because everybody's on zoom instead of just uh, a couple kids being out. Nobody. For that class, though, because that was the teacher. But what about your other classes? Were they then also synchronous? Like, were you were you able to keep up that way? It depends on the class. Yeah, that's um, it. Yeah, so it's really dependent on the class. I think more many of the STEM based classes, like my physics class, is like all remote. Uh, not all remote. It's always synchronous. So they have even when they have the class in the school, there's always the Zoom going. So. Uh -huh. I'm always called in. I'm always listening for classes. Like uh, I take just an English class and I take a psych class. It's kind of like, here's the work that we're doing in class. Do it on your own. It's, it's really dependent. You can't really, for those classes, you can't, they can't really do the synchronous. You know what I mean? So that's, that, that's the problem, but it's not awful. And aside from that, what was the overall feeling of the students and or teachers, if you heard anything, getting back into the classroom? Is there... They were just kind of just stoked. I mean, the first, the first week was a little, everyone was a little like on edge and everyone was like, oh, this school is a labyrinth right now. You have to uh, take the escalator that only goes one way, this way, then up, then left, then right, then down, then right to get to your class, which kind of stunk. But... For the most part, people were like, I'm in school. I'm happy to be in school. Like on a weirdness scale, people were like, it's a little weird, but I mean, I'm just trying to, I'm just happy to get to see people. Happy I get to wake up in the morning, have a reason to get dressed, get to go to school. Just people excited to, I mean, it's just exciting to see people. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I think for the most part, people were just kind of happy to be there. Happy to, happy to do what they can do. Yeah. Yeah, I think the isolation is one of the most difficult things about this. Um, what about everybody else in the community? Have you heard how in general people are doing or? Uh, people are doing fine for them in the interest in the school community with dealing with work. I think people are, they were, the first week was a little tough for everybody just to get back on that, that methodical, like, oh, I'm actually back in school kind of thing especially for a lot of the remote kids. I have two friends who are fully remote um, and they were like, yeah, I mean, at first I struggled, but then I realized that because it's self-paced, I just need to set deadlines for myself. So it's, it's a different style of learning in that sense. It's like you, especially for seniors, we've grown through this entire 12 year program of you go to school, you get your homework, you go home, you do your homework. It's just the same repeat, but it's literally like a Titanic shift into an indifferent gear of learning so mm -hmm. it's it's different in that sense but for the most part people are keeping up people are doing their best I think the high school is handling it well I it's the one thing I will say like my kind of closing note on this people are a little bit skeptical that the school will stay open is the one thing I've heard a lot of people talking about how they're giving it maybe three months, four months tops. School's going to stay open before everything goes remote. Mm -hmm. Josh, when you had to um, quarantine, did you have to wait a certain amount of time before you could get tested and um, the school would be satisfied with the results from it? So the school is making us quarantine and I mean quarantine as in not being able to attend school uh, for two weeks since exposure. Uh, I was exposed on Tuesday of last week. So not this week. I wasn't going to be in school this week anyway because it's on, off, remote, in person. Mm -hmm. So from Tuesday, not this Tuesday, but going in, I think, Thursday because we have Wednesday as a half day We're at home anyway. Um, so I'll be, I'll be in school from two weeks from exposure. I got tested this weekend. I had to wait three days since exposure. Cause that's how long it usually takes to develop in your system to wait three days since exposure. And then I could get tested and it took three days for the test to get back. Um, and that's when I got my negative test. So I can't really do anything school related. I can go on school zooms. I can, 
that that's as much I can I can help lead the club the club that I run through text um, but I can't really be in school I can't really be around school that much but even I can with do, your even, even with, with my negative, negative test, test. Oh, wow. which okay. that that is the one thing parent wise that has caused a commotion I will say not a ton of not a ton of students have been that furious about not being able to go back to school because they kind of just accepted that it's kind of for the best that they should quarantine. A lot of parents are kind of like these measures are a little much. These kids are like they're making the kids stay home. They weren't even really close contact. The teacher was wearing a mask. The kids were wearing a mask. It's really like there's just some disagreements. There wasn't really a plan for this situation, which is what was the real big problem. They didn't really have a plan for if a teacher got it and their students had to go out, what were the other teachers going to do? That wasn't really in question to get go. They kind of made the, the doomsday plan and the everything goes perfect plan. So well, they all, well, the problem, like even this week, there was another, a, a kid at another school tested positive um, at a younger school. But the problem was that the schools are on different guidelines than the CDC. So the health department in town was like, like they figured out who needed to quarantine and who could go back in mm -hmm. this. Oh no. Anyone in that classroom, even if they weren't co uh, close contact, they can't come back for 14 days. So then you're yeah. angry because the health department saying the kids can go back and the school saying they can't. And you've got parents saying, okay, I need to be out of work for 14 days to be home. Exactly. With my mm -hmm. So there was a, a big uproar today. And I think they, that worked itself out as of like two 30 today, but that started yesterday when a kid, that had tested positive was in like pre-care at one of the schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, I think it was also not the greatest timing because I think there was a change in guidelines like that happened fa like fairly recently. I think it was either this month or maybe like, like, like pretty close to when the teacher got ill. I don't know about, I don't know much about this, um, this younger child getting ill. Um, but it was just like a switch up of guidelines. So the school procedure didn't change while well, the CDC change, C CDC procedure did change a little bit. So there was a lot of confusion facing that mm -hmm. is what I heard from at least my mom and a, and a friend's mom who was also in quarantine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think everyone's just trying to do the right thing. No one's totally clear what the right thing is to make sure that kids are staying social enough, people are being health wise safe enough and it's just pretty complex mm -hmm. um adrian what's your have you guys been responding to a lot of crisis situations in the area or what is it, what is that looking like lately um some of the schools just have like parent issues uh which like you can't knock either side because i see both sides of it but like you said like everyone's trying to do their best um so there's been a few like parent versus school issues where it's like parents like no my kid's going to school and then the school's like no we won't take your kid or your kid needs to go home so I just think that everyone's on a little bit of a different page um, for crises I mean there have been mental health calls um, but they're always mental health calls so I don't know yeah we definitely had a, a significant amount of them but um, it's hard to say if I don't know. I, I guess you'd there is an uprise in, in mental health calls, but I don't, I mean, nothing specific that stands out. Um, we haven't had a suicide or an attempt in a couple weeks, which is good, um, but knock on wood. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been busy, but nothing overwhelming, I would say. I mean, I think Sarah traditionally I've been having this conversation with a lot of my clients and people is that September and October are always very stressful times for families. It's the getting back into the school routine, the new schedules, the tons going on. And, you know, I don't think that that's new. That's always there. It's just like an even more heightened level right. of anxiety. You know, we, we've all done the like back to school getting into the swing of things. It just, because I, I think Josh said it, you know, you, you do school one way for 12 years and then all of a sudden this year is very different. And so there's been a lot of, at least from my point of view, just like 
anxiety to that change and it being different, you know, so. Like general anxiety in the teachers every year, but this year it's so much more. And then, I mean, I think we have to hand it to like all the principals and the administrators in each building, because just for an example at the Pollard, like they have assigned seating for lunches so that if there's an exposure, they can contact trace where every kid sat that entire day. But mm -hmm. for the last two weeks, like it's rained on and off. So every single day that it rains in the morning, the administrators and the teachers have to figure out a plan of where all the kids that were gonna sit outside are gonna sit in the building and how they number those seats before lunch. So it's, like I said, everyone's just doing their best, but it, it's that level of anxiety. And I think the teachers, once they get in the classroom are, are fine because they're teaching and they know what to do. And they fall back into that, like, this is my job. I'm, this is all I'm doing is teaching with the mask on. But then like with, with like lunches or mask breaks, it's just different, it's weird. Like there's always classrooms outside just standing in a circle, socially distant, but just taking a mask break. Um, so it's just, it's just weird. And the schools are like eerily quiet because there's only like, I would say half, but probably less with the, um, cause there's obviously kids are going full remote. So the, they're just quiet, it's weird. There's like no one, it's. You guys also know there was an accidental um, drug overdose of an 18 year old um, like three weeks ago. So she would have been a freshman in college. So, um, I don't, you know, I don't, she, she actually didn't go to Needham High School. So maybe a lot of people don't know about it, but it was really sad. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, so, I think the school was notified about that. So I did have a conversation with um, Tom Dutton about that and how it, although they were on a Needham High School graduate, that it probably, that person was connected to some people within the school system and so they were making sure that they supported those people. Really connected in Yeah. So it was so tragic. Julia was my youngest was in school with the girl that died um, in elementary school. So I've been in contact with the family a bunch. Um, so, I mean I think they're planning on doing something. Um, doing something in her remembrance for drug abuse and stuff like that. Yeah, they're amazing people. So yeah. So, uh, that's a tough one. I've, you know, I've been working with that family for years. They're good people. Yeah. Um, so kind of on those lines, what our primary focus recently has been just how to support people that have these crisis needs. And I think that, you know, Josh, as you said, it is going to stay open. I don't know, but I think people are happy to be back and happy to be connected. And if that's lost again, with kind of no end in sight and the hopelessness around that, I think that we're definitely going to see some increased needs. So we have gotten the suicide, well, we are in the process of getting the Suicide Coalition back together. That first meeting is tomorrow with the hope that we're gonna start with some prevention efforts, um, some education, and then preparing for just mental health crises to come up and what is that gonna look like? And this is a group that met together for years and years and years and years. And, you know, they, the feeling was that there were enough things set up to, have some prevention efforts and education that they stop meeting regularly, but I think everyone sees the need of getting those meetings started again. So those are going to start up tomorrow. We're also, you know, YRN and CCIT, those meetings are still occurring regularly. CCIT, which is the Community Crisis Intervention Team, those meetings are happening more frequently than they had prior to the pandemic, because in those meetings, we really do talk about residents who are in crisis and might have higher needs. So we're a very active part of that. And then YRN continues to meet monthly. One of the other things that just recently got approved is I was able to create a um, donation fund for these crisis families. So in these meetings, we frequently talk about families that have various needs. Um, there was one single mother that needed a new stove because her stove broke and she couldn't afford to replace it. There was a family whose fence was falling down and they had a lot of younger kids that could then run, run out from the fence. Um, so we were able to get that fence fixed. And, fence fixed. 
Adrian has some students that she works with who um, they were going off to college and didn't have the means to be able to buy school supplies like sheets and basic things for themselves. So we created this donation fund so that um, people can donate into the fund and then we'll be able to use those funds to help the family where previous previously we've relied on community donations where you know, the clergy association will scramble to find somebody who will volunteer their time to fix the fence. Um, or the police department will go out and find a bike for a kid to be able to get to appointments and very different things like that. So this will hopefully. I've come bikes through quarantine. And I'm waiting for them. If they're not claimed, I'm giving them away. <laughs> I mean, kids need bikes. So important right now. So that fund will hopefully be up and running by next month and we'll be able to help kind of support in crisis. Is that just money or is it, you know, kind of donations of things if people are looking for things for college or whatever that people might have a bike around or have things around to donate as well as money? So the donation fund will just be money. But as part of the process of the, the two meetings, we always ask for community donations for various things. So we'll kind of get the word out like, oh, Adrian has a, a student that she's working with that's a senior that needs sheets and this and that, and then we'll get that word out. And then community members can donate that as well. I so have a, a, a wish list could be great. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking, um, I don't know who's on Need Them Buy Nothing, but it's this community organization oh. or community Facebook thing where, you know, I'm getting rid of some sleds. Does anybody want some sleds? And so there's tons of stuff that goes through there. Yeah, and, that's a great idea. And I always think about, well, you know, does somebody really who doesn't have access to it any other way as opposed to somebody who just doesn't want to buy it or whatever. I mean, it's this great like exchange of stuff you don't want anymore that right. you're thinking someone else can use. So I wonder if there's any way to tap into that as well. The biggest thing here is um, a couple of the kids, like there's obviously a green cohort for um, certain kids in specific situations that don't have home supports. And a couple of those kids, um, I've been talking to the administrators about, They just, I just see them almost like every, every day. Um, and they're coming Monday through Friday and they're in the same clothes. So there's a couple kids that we're talking about, like even if we just drop off clothes at their house because they're too proud to take anything from anyone. But, you know, it's, you almost feel bad that the kid wears the same exact outfit every single day. And it's only been like, what, a couple weeks. Even if take a phone call, so I have to leave the meeting, so I'm sorry. Um, everybody next month. Thank you, Susan. Okay, sorry about that. Hi, Susan. Okay. Sarah, for the fund part of it, how would it be funded? So it would just be community donations. So Beth Israel actually um, is the one that her and I started this conversation because they're interested in contributing to a fund like this. So I think that they'll, between the two of us, we'll get it kickstarted and they'll probably make some donations and then we'll just get the word out to the community if people want to make donations, big or small, you know, we'd be happy to take them. Yeah, I just, I happen to know there are rules around like soliciting funds for charitable organizations that you might just want to be, I don't know like the details of them, but I, it may be something to check out just to make sure that you're doing it in the right way. Yeah, definitely. Is this charitable or municipal? And there's probably another set of rules too. Right, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah, I had a meeting to get it set up with uh, Dave Davidson. So, uh, and the person at Beth Israel said like they would be in charge of um, soliciting the funds if we kind of controlled it in a way. So that's hopefully the way we could go about it, but that's a good point. I'll definitely make sure we're doing everything correctly before we move forward with it. But at any rate, I think that um, hopefully it'll be able to really help the community because we'll be able to access funds that weren't previously there, so. Um, another couple of big things coming up and then 
um, Carolyn, I'll give you a chance to talk <laughs> and talk about your programs. The job for joy that was the 5k that High Rock Church uh, did or put on for us last year that we were able to raise money for youth mental health first aid. They're doing it again this year and it's going to be inclusive of all High Rock churches, not just the one. So we're expecting it to be much bigger this year. A piece of the funds will always go to youth and family services, but they're also going to donate to some national organizations as well. So we're really excited to be a part of that process. It's going to be virtual this year too, which will be a little different. The other big thing we're working on is, so there is a fence on the rail trail that's been the target of some pretty um, offensive graffiti, I'll say. And so we are organizing a community art project with one of our expressive art therapists to hopefully go in and help the community socially distance with masks, probably have some sort of sign up, but to paint a huge mural on the fence. So we're hoping that um, it'll be something that'll bring the community together. Everyone in the community can be a part of being painting the fence and we'll have some kind of themes of positivity to really kind of inspire some sort of hope in today's world. So we need to get approval on all this and it has to, we have to do a couple things before that takes off, but we're hoping that that'll happen before the weather gets cold. Hi David, how are you? Good. <laughs> Sorry you missed the vote. We had a pretty <laughs> moment in the minutes. Uh... <laughs> Motion to adjourn? <laughs> not yet, not yet, not yet. <laughs> um, and then our other huge initiative right now is we talked a little bit about this last meeting, but to try to get some uh, community wide training slash webinars in place. So we just wrote a grant to try to put on three trainings this year. One would be around suicide prevention, one would be around substance use and mental health, and one would be around helping identify mental health needs in the communities and helping parents really identify these needs and also some racial inequities that have arisen recently and more so because of the pandemic. So we're hoping to go get those up and running. Hopefully I'll hear back about the grant in the next couple of weeks. And then we're also partnering with Engaging Minds, who's running an event for us in a couple of weeks, just around executive functioning and what that looks like given this virtual world. So those are our biggest initiatives. On a brighter note, the Ford Award will be happening this year virtually. So I've talked to the all the Ford family members and um, that's gonna kick off the same date. What is it, the last Monday in January, I believe. So we are um, sending out that nomination form. So if you know of anyone that you want to nominate or that you, you think that other people want to nominate, please do that. We were really excited to continue that on for the last couple of years. And the Ray of Hope Award that Luca won a couple months ago, we're looking for more nominations for that as well. Got to keep something positive in this world right now, so. <laughs> So Carolyn, do you want to talk about the programs you've been focused on recently? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, I, lo I love the fact that we kind of have different uh, things that we're focused on each season. So, you know, the summer was actually real busy for us. I, I think you all heard some updates that we did um, kind of a virtual uh, volunteers around Needham and, and that went great. Um, talking about this donation fund kind of got me thinking like, oh, maybe we could incorporate those volunteers some way and maybe we can talk more about that, Sarah. But, you know, we did that and we ran a, a little kids Zoom group over the summer and, and that was good. And, um, you know, really now uh, we had a big push this year for people looking to participate in the peer tutoring program, um, which has been really great. Um, I can't speak highly enough about the group of tutors that I have right now. Um, I have, we, so far at this point in the year, we've matched 40 tutors with 40 
um, elementary and middle school age students for one hour a week of virtual tutoring. And, you know, I think we were really transparent about it. We did, I ran a few different trainings and kind of acknowledged like, hey, this is new. We're used to doing tutoring, sitting next to someone and just the resiliency and flexibility to that all the tutors have been constantly showing me just checking in they're like coming up with these new creative ways to still connect with their um, students their two t's um, and it's it's been great i've gotten so much feedback from parents who just tell me like that their kid looks forward to meeting with their tutor and that it's so much um, extra support, um, especially on the remote school days. It, it's actually been going super well. I was a little bit nervous about, you know, how are people gonna make that connection virtually, but you know, I, I couldn't be more pleased. Um, and I think what's really nice is I have about, I guess maybe 18 students pairs that are um, continuing to work together. And I feel like that's the best case. I know Josh, you guys, you and Andrew are such a good, that was a good match. Um, I won't, I won't, I won't embarrass you. His mother thinks you're the greatest, like of all, of all times. Um, Josh is one of my tutors. And uh, so when the pairs keep working together, it's just like, oh, this is the sweetest thing ever. Um, um, you know, it, it's been great. Everything is a little tricky with the paperwork and doing all that, but ultimately I ended up meeting with every single pair, um, the tutor, the kids, and the parents, all the new people, um, and hosted little introduction meetings, and, and now it's, it's off to the races. People have been tutoring for three or four weeks now, and um, it's, it's been fantastic. I think you're all pretty familiar with this program at this point, but, um, you know, I recently was just chatting, you know, with Sarah and I was talking to Tim and we were just saying how, like, it's, it's great that despite everything that's going on right now, we're still able to have some of our programs that have always consistently been there. And I think, you know, we're, we're pretty proud of that. So it's been keeping me busy. Um, that's the big one for right now. But there's always talks about, you know, should we try to run a group? Like, what, what are the needs of the community right now? Um, I don't know, Sarah, do you want me to chirp in a little bit about thoughts for moving forward or other programs? That's kind of my big stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of why I wanted to get a pulse of what people's experiences were in the community and in the high school. And, you know, mm -hmm. over the past couple of months, we've tried to run a couple of parent support groups, you know, the, the group that you ran, a high school group. Um, so just kind of getting a sense of what, you know, the main goals would be to keep people connected. You know, I think the community project will hopefully bring people out. It's not just going to be youth focused. It'll be the community at large. So we're just trying to find creative ways to do that. I think the webinars will be huge. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if you can watch something while doing other things, that's key. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess the big question, and I'd be curious to hear from all of you, is it's like sometimes I feel, I don't even know what the word for it is. I say I feel a little zoomed out. Like there's a lot of, you know, a lot of Zoom meetings. And, and so from our end, you know, we're like, how do we continue with connections? How do we keep providing services and address the needs of the community? Um, but are, are people going to still want to access those things if it's via Zoom? You know, we've tried different groups, but like, is there anything that people think, you know, maybe is missing or we, we could address? I don't know if that's a question. I just, you know throwing it out there <laughs> it's that's a, that is tough because i totally i know exactly what you mean by the zoomed out thing i literally had to buy those blue light glasses so i don't have a migraine every single day um but yeah like it's it's all about it's not that people won't be interested if you do extend more offers about these activities you extend more offers about like things like this it's that 
how many they, they look at it they're like okay if it's on wednesday how many zooms am i going to have on wednesday you know what i mean if i'm going to have if i'm going to have a full day of class and then i'm going to have the jazz band zoom now i'm going to have my need and family youth services board zoom and then i'm gonna have this last zoom i'm not going to do that zoom right you just it's it's not really that people aren't going to be interested. It's just that they're going to weigh the pros and cons of their own schedule at a, in a different way than they did before. Sure. That's fair. I mean, so the little kids zoom group over the summer that I ran with our student intern, Shannon, um, we had a blast, but it was like three or four kids. It was a small little thing. Um, and the only goal was just to meet and have fun. But that was during a time when there wasn't a lot, there was no school Zoom meeting, so it worked. You know, um, the one need that I, we keep having come up is people are asking for their volunteer opportunities and trying to fill that kind of gap because there's, it sounds like there is still the graduation requirement. Um, so potentially some programming around that I think could be cool. Um, but David, were you going to say something? I was going to say, I don't, I'm not creative enough to think, but I'm wondering if there's a way that you could have a specific event that was like, um, cameras off. So like intentionally it was some kind of discussion where people could be cooking or being with the family or whatever, but like everybody was told, all right, for the first two minutes, we'll just have the cameras on so we can see who's here. And then the, the expectation is that everybody turns their camera off so that in microphones off unless you want to speak. And so maybe it was sort of like more like a webinar or training that somebody was sort of giving that you were hearing, but you could mm. participate if you wanted. Yep. Yeah, that was kind of my thought that the more we can do like that or and also, or also, um, Carolyn, like the vi we've talked about the volunteers around Needham program, kind of extending that because that we're organizing it and getting youth to do volunteer opportunities, but they're doing it on their own. And it's getting them away. Well, some actually are doing Zoom books and stuff like that, but it's getting them out and about a little bit more. Sure, I mean that that program worked great because all these different students um, essentially proposed. Uh, volunteer idea projects that they were going to do. You know, right. I had one student who said, you know, um, I've noticed that there's a lot of things that the local animal shelter is missing. I'm going to reach out to friends and family and see if I can collect donations. And, and that was his project and it was great. You know, other people did clean up, park cleanups and things like that. And, and basically I just oversaw it, but they did it on their own. Yeah. Um, so I, we can always kind of do something like that rolling, you know, um, I'm just trying to think of things I've done that kind of like pop in when you can. I feel like some of the vir like virtual like trivia is like what I've gone to or like if we did, <laughs> I don't know me. but um, you know, if there would be fun things for families like that, the, um, the little like summer box, like supply box of yeah. things. That, that was great. People liked that because I don't think it was a commitment to a meeting. Right. Maybe that's a, a little different way to yeah. look at it. What about some kind of family meditation or yoga, like just to pull on the experts from the town to like do something that was calming or even like a family talent show or something that, that people <laughs> listen in on as <laughs> families participate in that's a good idea i like yeah i like the family talent show but i would call it like david letterman had stupid human tricks <laughs> you know do it like that kind of so it is just not too serious but i also think there's something very unnatural about going to a zoom meeting and seeing everyone including yourself in a group when really when we could all meet in person it was always just looked at the one person and even like, it's very unusual to see everyone. It's exhausting. Yep. It's yeah. Yeah. Somebody I work with, we've been working. Dynamic. But um, but if like David said, everything if you could turn off your your cameras, that's yep. there's something nice about that. Yep. 
I like the stupid human tricks of the talent show. <laughs> or even like we've, um, if I was going to do a group again, uh, what I learned from over the summer is I would create kits that had all the supplies in it, just, just to make it easier for people. And then you don't have to deal with like, oh, I, I didn't bring, you know, I didn't bring my crayons. I didn't bring this piece of paper, you know, just having it all ready. But, you know, having a, a video or something that people tune into and maybe it's one of us. Like I, I miss doing the like family fun makers things and like th those kind of in, in person. I don't know. I just, I, you, you miss it. You, you're right. It is strange to be doing the Zoom meetings all the time. Sarah, how about a recipe swap? Since people are cooking at home, maybe there's some way to introduce people through recipes and then people could talk about it or it could, they could, when you have one of these qu quiet ones, you know, people could share yeah. pictures or something. Not yeah. before, the middle schoolers did that and they, like, that was their favorite thing. Um, yeah. Like, Amatha did um, a Zoom baking class every week. And the kids were fun. <laughs> Yeah, they like had such a good time. And then they um, they took pictures of their creation and they all shared it. And then she would make like a little whatever, a board or something of everyone's creations, like a, like a little collaboration of pictures. That might resonate. That might be really good to do a cooking or recipe thing. I mean, in my house, we don't turn off the oven anymore. It just was. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I've got to run. All the time. Okay, bye Karen, thank you. Okay, do we still have a cool, do we, do we have enough people? One, two, three, five. So five. Okay, perfect. Um, Carolyn, I was also thinking that, you know, family fun makers is something we could potentially continue virtually. We could yeah. check out. So as part of the grant, I actually put in there um, materials for group therapy. So we could do exactly what you're saying, where we could drop off kits to every member involved. But we could probably do that with family fun makers also and drop off oh, yeah. and something like that. So, I mean, it would be me like in my house doing the project, like sure. it would be me, like it, <laughs> <laughs> just like some kind of some, I don't know, that would be fun. We could yeah. figure it out. Yeah. You would have to log on and do it with your kids. <laughs> I'm sure that would go really well. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah no these are great ideas thank you guys for helping us brainstorm i mean i think also right now so much you know any anytime we lose uh not lose but if we're not running a program or you know the school workshops this year will probably not happen um because we can't go into the schools and be exposed to the entire seventh grade and the entire eighth grade um but you know, as we're dropping things that we had previously done, we're just picking up more and more clinical cases. You know, we were able to clear our wait list in the summertime when usually we have a really extensive wait list going into the fall. Um, so I think that that's been really great that we've been able to meet the clinical needs and have so many more cases. So. You know, I, and I will say, Sarah, um, what has been really interesting for me is you know, doing telehealth counseling, I mean, our, our caseloads skyrocketed, um, but because of the easiness of setting up times, I, I've been able to continue with certain clients that normally, normally we would say, okay, you know, summer's over, you're going to college, see you later. We might hear from them, we might not. You know, I've been able to have a handful of college students who you know, I talked to someone who's in DC and someone who's in college, but is in Needham too. And, you know, we've been able to keep doing that. And then with the remote days, um, there's been a lot of flexibility in the timing. Um, it's, it's actually, because we've picked up so many cases, I think that, you know, that's felt really good for our office to just keep you know, continuing to be able to say yes to people when they come to us and say, hey, I need some help, you know, with my mental health and support there. Mm -hmm. I think we've also fielded a lot more crisis calls, you know, like 
I've talked to parents once or twice about a specific issue and uh, community consults have come in pretty regularly in just helping families get connected to various services. So I think that's been really great too. Mm -hmm. Plus there's, a, there's an interesting um, personal element to it where I don't know if I would have connected with clients the same way um, in my office, uh, there, you know, it seems really minor, but when little kids are like, do you want to see my room? And like, these are my favorite stuffed animals. And this is my dog. Um, some of those, uh, opportunities to build rapport have been unbelievable. Yeah. You just gotta find those things yeah. in it. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Carol. Of course. So does anyone have any questions or thoughts of anything that we haven't discussed yet? That's kind of the update on our end. Right. How are you guys managing with like, do, do, do you guys have to go into the office or are you all remote or how, how does it work? Um, so we're keeping the office open. So we're all assigned a different day during the week so that if there are any immediate needs that we have to be in for, there's almost always somebody there. Um, and we're just trying to spread it out where, because the way our office is situated where you have to cross paths to be able to go anywhere, um, we only have one person in the office at a time right now is by appointment only so if we know we have an appointment we'll be there we're not really doing too many appointments at town hall um there have been a couple people who meet with clients outside and take a walk or we've had meetings outside um but for the most part everything's been able to be remote or outside of them, so it's been fine that's good interesting place right now with you know you're walking around with masks on and you know we're on the lower level that doesn't have too much foot traffic so it's it's quiet which is nice we i get a lot done when i go in but it's definitely a different feeling than it was before but it's really nice you know the picnic tables they put out front with the big tents it's nice to see people congregating and having lunch and you know finding ways to socially distance and still have connections so that's great. We're definitely making it work. Um, yeah, I will. It, it's interesting being in the office. It's not like we were never there alone, but to be in the office alone for an extended amount of time um, yeah. is interesting. You know, we each have our day and, you know, to get a lot of paperwork, printing, things like that done. Um, you know, uh, it's interesting uh, clients when you meet with them via Zoom, but you're in your office and they're like, where are you? Like, why are you there? Um, <laughs> you know, ki kids are so funny. They're like very, particularly the people who used to come into the office are like fascinated by your house. Like they were like, what room are you in? Where are you? What's, you know, <laughs> what are you eating? It's, it's pretty funny, you know, and then we have some clients that I've never met them in person. Um, yeah. And they own me in, in my house. Um, so it, you know, but we're making it work. It's good. That's great. Yeah. Life goes on. We, we, we yeah. <laughs> All right, Sarah, is there anything else or? I don't think so. I think that's, that's everything. Unless anyone has questions, comments, concerns. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second? Second. Oh, she got it. <laughs> All right. Until next month, everyone. It's harder right. with the, uh, turning the microphone off. I have to be ready to unmute myself. <laughs> right. All, All right. right. It was nice everyone. seeing you all. Good yes, to it see was very nice seeing you, everybody. Thank you for all you're doing. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Sarah, sorry I was a little late. That's okay, no worries.